In the spring of 1951, at the age of 75, in a sudden burst of inspiration during a severe illness, Jung wrote a little essay of around 100 pages. It was virtually dictated to him from the unconscious, and as soon as it was completed, his illness was over. In July 1951, he writes, If there is anything like the spirit seizing one by the scarf of the neck, it was the way this book came into being. Two years later, Jung described this episode as such. The experience of the book was for me a drama that was not mine to control. I felt myself utterly the cause ministerialist of my book. It came upon me suddenly and unexpectedly during a feverish illness. I feel its contents as the unfolding of the divine consciousness in which I participate, like it or not. This book was titled Answer to Job. In appraisal of this book, Edward Adinger says, In my opinion, it has the same psychic depth and import as characterized the major scriptures of the world religions. In accordance with the modern mind, it differs from these scriptures in its modesty of expression and in the objective consciousness that illuminates it. One should not be deceived by its personal, unpretentious style. It is this very quality that demonstrates its authenticity. Although he describes the most profound encounters between the ego and the archetypal psyche, Jung never falls into an identification with the archetype. His attitude is always that of the limited human ego. It is never inflated or grandiose. Answer to Job lays the groundwork for a new worldview, a new myth for modern man, a new disposition that connects man to the transpersonal psyche in a new way. In Jung's words, his insights may well involve a tremendous change in the God image. To understand answer to Job, a new dispensation is very much necessary, but there can be no question of a new dispensation as long as one is comfortably contained in the old one. Jung writes, I am not addressing myself to the happy professors of faith, but to those many people for whom the light has gone out, the mystery has faded, and God is dead. For most of them there is no going back, and one does not know either whether going back is the better way. To gain an understanding of religious matters, probably all that is left us today is the psychological approach. That is why I take these thought forms that have become historically fixed try to melt them down again and pour them into molds of immediate experience. Now here is a need to make a distinction between containment and relatedness. Containment is an unconscious phenomenon of psychic identification. One can be contained in a religion just as one can be contained in a family or other collective group. One then has no individual living relation to the numinous archetypes. Relatedness to a religion, on the other hand, means connecting with it out of one's individual numinous experience. In this case, we don't have a community of believers, but rather a community of knowers, or better, a community of individuals, each of whom is a carrier of the living experience of the self. Hence the psychological approach to religious imagery is not available at any depth to one who is contained in a particular religious myth. Jung is quite explicit about this. I do not write for believers who already possesses the whole truth, rather for unbelieving but intelligent people who want to understand something. The believer will learn nothing from my answer to Job since he already has everything. I write only for non-believers. However, since the Judeo-Christian myth is at the foundation of the Western psyche, we are all believers to some extent, either consciously or unconsciously. That is, we all have some residual psychic containment in that myth. This means that answer to Job will be a cause of offense or misunderstanding for practically everybody. If one is a religious believer, he will be afraid of acknowledging his unconscious doubt. 
if one has no religious beliefs, he will be afraid to admit his sense of spiritual emptiness. These are the two most common sources of offense to the readers of Answer to Job. Either one is offended that Jung describes Yahweh so outrageously in contradiction to the dogmatic God image in which he believes, or one is offended that Jung takes so seriously the primitive anthropomorphic image of God that has long since been discredited by the rational intellect. Answer to Job is a psychological commentary on the entire Hebrew Christian myth as it is enshrined in the Bible in both the Old and the New Testaments. The Bible contains highly numinous archetypal contents which are dangerous to approach under certain conditions. It is dangerous for one who is aware of psychic reality, but it is relatively safe for one who is embedded in a religious orthodoxy. In that case, the powerful archetypal images like wild animals are safely caged behind the bars of the creed. The Bible is also safe when approached from a purely rational intellectual standpoint as do the biblical scholars. In that case, it is as if one studied pictures of Africa and its wild animals. But if one is open to the unconscious and to psychic reality, then to approach the numinous contents of the Bible is like going on a real African safari and meeting the untamed power of life face to face. Psychologically, the danger is inflation, to be eaten up by an archetype. The base protection is to be connected with one's wholeness, most definitely including one's dark and guilty limitation. As Jung tells us, in these circumstances, it is well to remind ourselves of Saint Paul and his split consciousness. On one side, he felt he was the apostle directly called and enlightened by God, and on the other side, a sinful man who could not pluck out the thorn in the flesh. When Mary Louise von Franz once asked Jung how he could live with the knowledge he had recorded in answer to Job, Jung replied, I live in my deepest hell, and from there I cannot fall any further.